Well, hello, Xenographers everywhere, and welcome to another episode. 50mm lenses from the former Soviet countries make great choices for anyone who wants to shoot quirky old vintage glass. They're cheap, they're simple, they're well made, and they make some great images. They're mostly copies of earlier Western designs, mostly Zeiss designs from the 1930s. Optically then, they're very nice indeed, and because they're such old designs, they have quirks and flaws that continued right up until production ended in the mid-90s. But that doesn't make them bad lenses. In fact, these lenses are great precisely because of those flaws. Technical perfection, whatever that is, does not equal aesthetic perfection, whatever that is. So today's 10 lenses are the Fed 10 uncoated, the Fed 10 coated, the Understar 61, the Understar 61 LD, the Understar 22, the Understar 50, the Pentacon F1.8, the Carl Zeiss Jenner Tessar F2.8, the Jupiter 8, and the Helios 44. So, we'll begin with the delightful little Fed 10 50mm f3.5. I've been using the uncoated version for some years now, and it really is a beautiful little thing in terms of both its design and its optics. It feels like a 1930s lens. It's not that fast at f3.5, it's simply constructed and it's all metal too, with no plastic parts anywhere. It makes beautiful low contrast images that feel straight out of the 1930s, and although it does represent colour very nicely, I think it works better in black and white, where its inherent low contrast and slight softness combined to give images something of a low contrast film look. If I need a lens that will give an old school feel straight out of camera, this is the one I reach for. Colours are nicely rendered, although saturation isn't particularly high. Colours seem natural and realistic and they're very pleasing too, pale without being washed out, natural looking but still full and strong. With a maximum aperture of f3.5, this isn't the blurriest lens in the world, even at its minimum focus distance of 3 feet, and that's another factor that helps it to create that old school look. But even though there's not much of it, I like its blur very much. It's smooth and soft, with no harsh points that I can see, and at closer distances, it's enough to separate the subject from the background and to focus attention on it. Now, this is an uncoated lens, so it flares pretty readily. Any hint of stray light that catches the lens at the wrong angle causes contrast to drop dramatically, and it washes out part of the frame. Technically, of course, this is quite a flaw, but I kind of like it, and if you control it carefully, it makes some very cool effects. Now, thanks to viewer Derek Holmes, who recently sent me a bunch of Russian lenses to review, I've been shooting the coated version of the Fed 10, and some very interesting points have arisen from that comparison. So, many thanks for the loan, Derek. The coating gives this lens, which is identical to the uncoated one in all other respects, a rather different feel and flavour. It's still not particularly sharp, it's entirely sharp enough, but it's certainly not the sharpest I've seen. But this lens has a bit more contrast. Images are fuller, feeling solid and more substantial than the sometimes thin and somewhat ethereal images from the uncoated lens. The coating seems to make it handle colour differently too. They still feel a little restrained, but now they have a vibrancy, a body and a depth that colours from the uncoated lens just don't. These colours have a much more modern look, and I think on balance I prefer them to the colours from the earlier lens. For me, they're just that bit nicer, and sometimes they're quite a lot nicer. Richer, fuller and with more depth. Really quite beautiful. 
Again, there's not too much blur to be had from this relatively slow lens, but of course there's blur if you shoot up close and wide open. It's very nice and very soft and it seems to have a little swirl, something I didn't notice from the uncoated lens. It is there, but it seems a bit more prominent on the coated version. This is a very, very nice lens in both coated and uncoated versions, and it's not particularly expensive either. Both versions can be found for around 40 to 60 pounds, and in my view, that would be money well spent. Next, we have one of the cheapest 50mm lenses in the world, and it can often be found for around 10 to 15 pounds, so it's got to be one of the best value lenses out there. It's the Indostar 61, a Tessar design, so it's pretty sharp. It's quite a bit sharper than the Fed 10. In fact, it's one of the sharpest lenses from the former Soviet photographic industry. With a maximum aperture of f2.8, it has blur to complement that sharpness too. It emerges very readily if you're close to the subject, and it's really, really nice. It's soft and smooth, and if there are point light sources in the background, they break out into hundreds of lovely bubbles. Just beautiful. It's surprisingly nice for portraits too. Colours are represented very nicely indeed, strong and vibrant with good saturation, but not oversaturated. They're perhaps best described as true to life or naturalistic. The lens is inherent strong contrast, lending body and depth. Although it's a coated lens, it does flare quite a bit if there's a light source in the frame, and contrast does fall away. There were two main versions of this lens, the Indostar 61 and the Indostar 61 LD, which uses the radioactive element lanthanum in its glass, hence LD. This isn't a radioactive lens in the usual sense though. Lanthanum is far less radioactive than the thorium used in some of the Pentax lenses, for example. For all intents and purposes, this lens is not radioactive at all. There is some marketing going on with all this though because the instruction manual for the Fed 4 camera that shipped with the Indostar 60. One big difference though is in the quality of construction. The later lens is more nicely made. It's much tighter and it has a lot less play and looseness between components. It's clearly been made to tighter tolerances and because of that it feels nicer to use. These lenses are cheap really cheap. At around 10 or 15 pounds it's not really a question of whether you can justify buying this lens, it's more a question of whether you can justify not buying one. The Carl Zeiss Jenna Tessar is a 50mm f2.8 lens from the former East Germany that often shipped with Practica SLRs. Carl Zeiss Jenner lenses are often quite expensive, but this one is the exception that proves the rule. At around 15 to 20 pounds, it's the cheapest Zeiss Jenner lens, and it might just be the best value one too. Like all Zeiss Jenner lenses, colour rendition is outstanding. It renders colours beautifully. They're big and bright and bold and saturated, with plenty of punch and loads of depth. Other lenses can mute colours a little bit and have a restrained character, but not this one. Colours are saturated and vibrant, and they really leap out of the image. It's a very sharp lens too. Good sharpness is a characteristic of the Tessar design, and if you nail focus accurately, it resolves loads of fine detail. And just like many other Zeiss Jenner lenses, it focuses really closely too, right down to 35 centimeters, which makes it a really versatile lens. It's not a macro lens by a long way, but as far as I'm concerned, the closer you can focus, the better. With a maximum aperture of f2.8, this isn't the blurriest lens out there, and as I understand it, that's a limit of the Tessar design. It's difficult to make a Tessar lens with an aperture wider than f2.8, but because of its short minimum focus distance, 
this lens can still make plenty of the blurry stuff and it's really nice blur too. Soft, gentle, creamy and dreamy without any obvious harsh spots where things get busy or nervous. A great little lens, optically excellent, very sharp with great colour, some very nice blur and very cheap too. The Indostar 22 is a 50mm f3.5 collapsible from the Ukraine, supplied throughout the 1950s with Fed and Zorki rangefinders. With its chrome plating and collapsible barrel, it's got a real retro look, and despite its tiny size, this little lens makes some great images. It's a sharp and contrasty lens, and in those areas it resembles some much more expensive lenses. It's got great colour rendition too. Colours are nicely saturated with plenty of punch. They're not quite as vibrant as the Zeiss Jenner lens though. They're a little more subdued, a little more naturalistic, but strong and vibrant nevertheless. With its f3.5 maximum aperture, it is a bit slow, and even shooting at its minimum focus distance of 1 meter or 3 feet, it's not going to make too much background blur. This is a vintage rangefinder lens, and in that sense, it does have a vintage aesthetic. What blur there is, though, is soft and gentle, and it's enough to just take the sharp edges from the background. Bokeh junkies, might think that insufficient, but I think it's nice and it does encourage tidier composition. Those 1950s single coatings seem to work well and they do a good job of reducing flare and ghosting effects. By the way, don't collapse this lens on a digital body, it will hit the sensor. A lovely bit of kit, small, light and stylish and yours for around 30 to 50 pounds. The Pentacom 50mm f1.8 is another SLR lens from the former East Germany and it's a lovely little thing. Its images have a real retro feel and even on a digital camera their overall look reminds me of shots made on film. Its background blur is pretty wild and if you shoot it wide open point light sources form hundreds of bubbles in the back of a shot. They're completely wild and totally uncontrolled and we're left with a profusion of bubbly goodness that just can't be restrained. Now some might say these wild and unruly ways make it a bad lens but I don't agree. I think they make it a great lens. It focuses really closely too. It'll go right down to 30 centimeters closer even than the Zeiss Jenna Tessar, and because of its wide aperture, at those distances blur becomes very blurry indeed. It's not just a question of quantity either, its quality changes too, and at closer distances it's very soft and very lovely. It's not lacking in sharpness either, and while it's not quite as sharp as the Carl Zeiss Jenna Tessar or the Indostar 61, it's entirely sharp enough. Contrast is good, though like most vintage lenses, it will fall away if you're shooting towards a light source or if a stray ray should catch it at the wrong angle. But technical flaws such as this aren't so important because this lens's greatest strength, I think, is its character and the atmosphere it can create. And for that, there are few better lenses. A good copy will cost around £30, so as well as being one of the most fun lenses you can buy, it's one of the cheapest too. The 58mm Helios 44 f2 was the first vintage lens I shot on digital, and it's a lens I've continued to use over the years because it's just so nice. This lens had a very long production run, and there are several versions. I prefer the earlier versions though, the 44 and the 44 too, because they have the most swirl in their background blur. If you like a bit of the swirly stuff, this is the lens for you. This lens is sought after for its swirl making abilities, and to make that appear, shoot wide open with a natural background about 10 to 15 feet from the subject, 
with the camera about five to eight feet from the subject. Get the distances right and the swirl just leaps out right in front of your eyes. Most of the time the blur's quite conventional though, it's nice and soft for much of the time and it's mostly well behaved and because it's slightly long at 58mm and reasonably fast at f2 this lens will give you some separation at longer distances. Contrast is neither particularly high nor particularly low, sitting somewhere in the middle and the lens makes pleasing images in both black and white and colour with plenty of old school feel. It will flare if stray light catches it at the wrong angle, but not as badly as some as the front element is recessed quite deeply within the body and when it does flare, the flares have a rather nicer quality than some. A very nice lens indeed, one of my personal favourites and yours for around £30. Next is the tiny and rather delightful Indostar 50 50mm f3.5. There were two versions of this lens, a rangefinder version with an L39 screw mount made in both fixed and collapsible versions and a much smaller M42 mount version for Zenit SLRs which must be one of the smallest if not the smallest 50mm lens in the world. And many thanks to viewer Derek Holmes for sending me these wonderful multiple versions of the lens to complement my slightly battered one. The rangefinder version focuses to 1m, while the SLR version goes down to a useful 65cm. With its maximum aperture of f3.5, it's not the fastest lens in the world and it's not the best in low light either. If you're shooting on a digital though, you can always boost ISO to compensate. It's a surprisingly sharp lens. It's sharper than the Indostar 22 and I think it's a little sharper than the Indostar 61. Whatever the case, this is one of the sharpest lenses from the former Soviet countries. Stopping down doesn't significantly improve things either. At f3.5 it gives near maximum sharpness. I love the colour signature from this lens. There's good saturation but not too much. It stops just short of the oversaturated look. Colours are resonant but natural. Much as they look in life in fact. I really like the way it renders black and white too. Images have a delicacy and a smoothness that I haven't seen from many other lenses. Tones are clear and distinct without being too contrasty. In fact, this is one of my favourite lenses for monochrome images. Contrast is good and although it drops off a little if light catches it at the wrong angle, it doesn't happen too readily. This is a lens you can shoot without a hood for much of the time at least. With a maximum aperture of f3.5, there's not a great deal of blur on hand, but there is enough to make some striking and beautiful images with a lovely soft feel, particularly if you stay close to the subject. The blur has a soft quality that never seems to become harsh or nervous, however distances change, and the lens's inherent sharpness helps to separate the subject from the background. This is a lovely little lens, small, sharp and very nicely made. Quite a charmer. It's inexpensive too. You can find a good one for around £15 or so, although collapsible versions go for around £40 to £60. The Jupiter 8 50mm f2 is another favourite lens of mine. It's a sonar design and it's a really beautiful little optic. Like most of this group of lenses, it was made in huge numbers over 30 or 40 years, so they're very cheap to buy. A good one will cost around 30 or 40 pounds. It's housed in a neat aluminium body. There were several varieties, some with focusing tabs, some without, some silver bodies and some black bodies, but they're all essentially the same. This is a low contrast lens. It's not quite as sharp as the Indostar 50 or 61, but I think it makes nicer images. It's softer, 
more gentle, smoother, with a very dreamy feel. Blur is lovely from this lens. It does have a couple of slightly harsh spots as subject and camera distances change, but for the most part it's soft and lovely all the way through, and as it's an f2 lens up close, there's plenty of blur available. Point light sources give loads of lovely bubbles, and I've made a couple of nice portraits with it too. Contrast is not particularly high on this one, but it's high enough. Images never look washed out or weak, that is, unless you happen to catch some stray light at the wrong angle, when it will flare as readily as most other vintage lenses. Colour representation does seem to have subtly changed over the years, perhaps because of changing glass composition or different coatings. Later ones seem to be on the cool side, while earlier ones are a little warmer. My personal favourite is this 1967 model. It's a bit battered and somewhat the worse for wear, but I love its colour balance. For me, this one hits the sweet spot. This is a delightful little lens, and its images compare very well with those from the Leica Summit R 50mm f2, a much more expensive lens. Grab one while you can. So there we are, 10 wonderful little lenses. They all make fantastic images, they've all got bags of 1930s charm and character, and perhaps best of all, they're all cheap. So that's it from me for now. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. And if you like the content on this channel and you'd like to support it, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As ever, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more xenography.